Please remain standing for today's scripture lesson. The first passage comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47, titled, The First Converts and Life Among the Believers. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as, much, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The second passage comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, titled, A Call to Persevere. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet another, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, he had two shoes on when she had put him in his car seat. But when she had opened up the sliding door of the van to get her son out of his car seat and into uh, the carriage uh, that was awaiting for him that she took about 5, 10, 15 minutes for her to get that stroller uh, that was supposed to be so easy to unfold and to push out and to make a nice uh, riding, uh, carrying uh, case for her son. Uh, she was frustrated with that, and when she looked at him and saw only one shoe on his foot, she didn't know where it was. I mean, it wasn't on the floorboard where if he tried to kick it off, so she started looking under the seat and under the front seat and over on the other side. The shoe was not to be found. She did find her sunglasses that she had lost for about a, a week, but uh, she was getting kind of frustrated to the point at which she thought it might be just as easy to fold uh, the stroller up, put it in the back of the of the van, close the doors up, and just go back home. Ever felt that way in the parking lot at the church? <laughs> Surely that has probably happened to you maybe once or twice if you're the ones that's blessed with, with children in your life that you're wanting to nurture in the faith, that the, the clothes that you laid out for them on Sunday morning are not the clothes that they're wearing at church that day. And sometimes the attitudes and the activities that take place before church are so distracting, sometimes so problematic, that you're not even in the right frame of mind to worship God at all. 
Well, I want you to know that I commiserate with you if you have gone through that today. But as we begin this series this month on hashtag for the family, and as we look at today, worship, I want you to know that it's not beyond missing in my life that sometimes these things take place before you ever get here into the life of of trying to worship God on this day. But I do want you to know, and hopefully that you'll more fully understand by the end of our time and our service today, how important this task is for you and for me to enter into this house of worship, to experience God's presence, to be role models for our children and induce our children to the habits of the faith that will help them draw near to God and understand their place in God's plan for them in their life. I had the great opportunity uh, this past week or the week before to to talk to a, a young man about his faith pilgrimage. And in our discussion, it became quite apparent because I asked him, he says, do you go to church? And he says, oh, we are way too busy to go to church. We have so many things going on that we have never been able to fit it into our family schedule. Well, I shared with him that I would like an opportunity to speak more with him about this and also with his parents about the importance, uh, especially in this time of your life of faith development, that the that being a part of the life of the church and being a part of this worshiping community and what role it will play in your life. But I do understand that that our busy, hectic schedules do play a role in how many times that we may actually enter into the life of the church to, to worship God and to experience God's grace for our lives and to hear a word from the scripture and a word for our daily living. But I do also want you to know that worship is central to our relationship with God and one another. It is it is important that you and I also understand our relationship to our children for nurturing them in the faith. I don't know if you've ever seen artwork about the Ten Commandments. Sometimes on stained glass, you will see Moses with two tablets in his arm. And sometimes in uh, Roman numerals, you'll see one through four on one of the tablets and five through ten on the other. And the reason for that, if you see that, is the first four commandments have to deal with God and seemingly the five through ten have to do with our relationship with one another. Hence, when Jesus said that that the law could be summed up into loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, ten commandments, one through four, And then love your neighbor as yourself, commandments 5 through 10. We we can see that, that God has kind of laid out a plan for us. But I had a professor that saw on one particular depiction of the Ten Commandments, and he didn't know if it was for symmetry or not. It had 1 through 5 on one side and 6 through 10 on the other. And so it caused him to do some thinking about it. He was a professor of Christian ed and and Christian discipleship. And so if you remember that that number one is uh, you'll put no other gods before me, you know, and and number two, you'll make no graven images. Uh, Number three, thou shalt not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, Number four was keep, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then number five was honor your mother and your father that your days might be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. So he was wondering how five might be related 
to the love of God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then it dawned on him that the Jewish community was a faith community by birth. You were born into the faith. Your mother and father were Jewish. And so it was everything that you learned about your faith was through your mom and your dad. And so honoring your mother and father are those who are going to be instructing you in the faith or teaching you the habits and the spiritual disciplines of the faith. It's your mom and dad where you learn your relationship between yourself and God and your brothers and sisters and neighbors in the world. So it might be interesting as we think about worship this day and we think about family life, the the role that we play as moms and dads to ensure that our children have faith, which means just as importantly that we have faith as well. And that faith is nurtured in this relationship where God, Christ promised that where two or three are gathered in his name, he would be in our midst. That in this worship service, that we can experience God's grace that is sufficient for whatever thing that you and I might be going through. Now, the interesting thing is for you and for me is that we might think of ourselves as, well, you know, I do my best to, to keep most of the commandments, right? And we do remember that the fourth commandment was to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And that that, the Sabbath has always been a day for worship of God. Now, we worship not on the seventh day of the week, but some might say the eighth day or the first day of the week on Sunday rather than on Saturday, because that is a day of resurrection. That is the reason why we worship today as opposed to yesterday. But this worship that we are involved in is a reminder of what God is doing in our life. That this worship that you and I are involved in is reminding our children that God is real and still active in the world. But because, just like uh, the young man that says, we are busy, and we've not been able to find time to, to put church into our, to our schedule, you might think of yourself as that, okay, then maybe we're doing a really good job of fulfilling nine out of the Ten Commandments. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm not going to put it for open discussion about which one of the commandments you would like not to be able to obey on a regular basis. But it does seem as if Sabbath keeping and worship keeping for people of faith, because I have talked to so many people who consider themselves, and I don't doubt them, that they're spiritual people and people of spiritual worth, of course, but do not put worship as a regular part of their habit because they're busy. They have not found time for it in their life. But I want to share with you that removing that particular religious habit out of your life can have some profound effect for you and for me. I don't know how it is in your household, but I think in our house we have a television that's going 24-7. It's almost always on whether anybody's watching it or not. I don't know if it's just the white noise of our house or we just are, have lost the remote and we don't know how to turn it off. But I've noticed uh, that one of the prevailing channels that tends to be on is one of the cooking, uh, I guess it is the cooking channel, where they have all these competitions going on. And I came in the middle of one of them where there was a baking competition was going on and they hadn't quite got to the finals but they were like in the middle of the eliminations and everything was timed they only had so many minutes to uh, prepare uh, this particular dessert this particular cake uh, with uh, all of the ingredients that they were given to showcase their skills with and uh, because there's such a limited amount of time that they have every mistake that you make uh, 
can't be undone. There's just not time for it. And so on this particular episode, someone was pulling out their cake tins, and they just looked at them, and you could just see, I, I couldn't really tell right off the bat what would happen, but their head went down. But there was no time to bake anymore, so they got the cakes out, and they made a beautiful-looking cake. But when it came time for the testing, you could tell in the judge's face that the cake was not good. The, 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 one of the judges says, I don't know what you did, but this cake is dense and hard. And the chef said, yeah, I, I left out one ingredient. I forgot to put in baking powder. Now, isn't that interesting? That baking powder, I don't know if you've ever tasted it or not, but it, it, it's not a very, it doesn't really add a lot of flavor to the cake. So meaning that that cake had, I think, because the, the chef said, I only left out one thing. <laughs> so it had all the tasteful ingredients that was supposed to make that cake a delight to eat. But they had left out a major ingredient that ended up making it dense and hard and unenjoyable to consume. Have you ever noticed people who are weighed down and heavy and dark and unenjoyable sometimes to be around? I'm not saying that they don't worship, but I do know a Lord and a Savior that says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. Because, see, Jesus is able to give you and me tasks for life that truly have meaning and purpose. That in our worshiping time together, we experience the risen Lord anew that gives us hope and strength for this week that lays ahead of you and me. So that when we just maybe leave out this one ingredient called worship, and we leave it out of our daily, our weekly practice of our faith, it can be almost like leaving baking soda out of your cake mix. It could leave you heavy and flat, and life loses its luster and taste. Worship is this opportunity to experience this joy of God, to experience his presence. But it also enables the, for those who are in attendance for the body of Christ, as we heard in the scripture today, that, that uh, it creates a community who breaks bread together, who eats together, who sings together, who worships God together, and are reminded in Hebrews that we need to keep that up in our lives, that we need to persevere in that, which means is that many of you have made wonderful friends in the faith over the years of gathering together. And if I know anything about United Methodist worshiping is that a lot of you sit in the same seats every Sunday, which means is that you know the same people in front of you and the same people behind you, and you can even give alert messages if you're so inclined to a visitor when they sit in the wrong seat. You say, you might want to just scoot down just a little bit. But because of these relationships that you and I make as we worship God and we understand that, that we are not just a collection of individuals who have decided to show up on a Sunday morning to worship God, is that we're actually the body of Christ, that you and I are parts of a whole, that, that there is a relationship that is developed within us that we can encourage and and help one another. This was driven home to a, a young couple, a young man who lost his first job out of college. Uh, he had had it for a little while, but evidently it wasn't working out. He was the sole income for the family. They had two children. 
And when he was told that he was being let go, it, it just hit him so hard because this is what he was hoping to have his career in. He was hoping to be with his company for a long time. He loved working in the office. He enjoyed the work that he was doing, but for whatever reason, they were letting him go, and he had no source of income on the future horizon, so he had to do something quickly because there were people at home who wanted to eat and wanted to be clothed and fed. And so with his resources of friendships, he, he found a labor job with a construction uh, company where he was the one that was uh, providing the, the bricks for the bricklayer and the mortar to them. A very menial task, job, not paying for his brains or his college education, but he learned a lot that he did not like about this job. He said that one of the first things I noticed, they have a whole colorful vocabulary that they use here uh, at the workplace that we never used in the office. He says, I got called all kinds of names that I hadn't been called since I was in junior high or high school, and some of them were a lot worse. And every mistake I made, which I didn't think you could make that many just hauling bricks and, and shoving mortar, but I had to live that mistake with those men over and over all day and sometimes into the next. My boss was always, the foreman was always on me, putting me down and yelling at me. I longed so much for the work that I had he said that that very first week of work, he said that when Friday comes and they bring by the paycheck, that's going to be my first and my last check here. I'm going to find work somewhere else. Well, on Friday came at the end of the shift, the foreman was coming through with the uh, paychecks, and when he came to him, he says, hey. And actually, he had the nicest look on his face he had seen all week. He says, there's a woman in the front office that says she knows you. As he was handing the check, he said, well, what's her name? And he told her her name. He says, oh, she goes to our church. He said, yeah, she said she's kept your kids. and said, well, she, she volunteers in the nursery, but we see each other and worship a lot too. So he said, well, good, here's your check. And he went on and started passing out other checks. And he, and he opened up his check, and inside it was, was a note. He pulled the note out, and it was from her. It says, when a part, I think she was quoting from 1 Corinthians, when a part of the body of Christ hurts, we all hurt. I'm praying for you and your family. In Christian love, she signed her name. Wow. I guarantee you there are some people right now though they may not have lost their job but they've had a member of this worshiping congregation send them a card of encouragement sent them a text of scripture that was to give you strength and encouragement You've had people who you know who are worshiping God together, who sees our relationship that we're building together in Christ, that knows that you are hurting, that you're going through a tough time, and they went out of their way to remind you that we're in it together, and that we're praying for you, and that we're encouraging you. So I know that it may be difficult to get here on Sunday morning. I know getting from your driveway to this pew can be a, a, a tough task. But I want you to know that this is probably the one major ingredient in your life that's going to make the most difference for you and for your family by being here because this is for sure the place that God promises to be here for you and for us by gathering in his name. And this is the place where you're going to create memories with your children that they're going to look back on and look on to for strength and guidance when they're going through dark times. 
They're going to remember kneeling with you at the chancel rail receiving communion. They're going to remember when y'all passed the candlelight on Christmas Eve. They're going to remember when we rang the bell for their grandmother or their grandfather who had passed away when we have All Saints uh, Sunday and they're here in worship. They're going to remember the Easter and hearing the powerful message of resurrection in their life. They're going to remember what it's like to see mom and dad sing the hymns, the songs of faith. They're going to remember what it's like to be nurtured and reared in the life of the church. And you know why I know that? Because that's what was done for me. And I cannot tell you how important that was to my life that my family, my grandmother, made sure that she and we <laughs> were worshiping our God together every week. I trust and I pray that you find that same joy too with your family. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.